Today, we're going to do a demonstration for you uh, consisting of a landscape painting taken from a photograph I've taken myself of a, a, local, a local view in Lancashire, England of Pendle Hill. And uh, you, those of you who will have downloaded the images will have seen the final product of the painting. In fact, there's one here displayed. I will work through the painting very quickly in this demonstration. Uh, I do work very fast. Um, from your point of view, that might be difficult for you to follow, but I'm sure some of you who are competent enough to and good and skilled enough to do that, and um, by all means do paint along with me. But uh, those that are a little bit slower, perhaps you might like to wait until the end of the, my demonstration and then I'll go through a nice stage by stage. This is my photograph that we looked at previously. And this is the, the, pen, the uh, biro sketch, but I will transfer with my pencil, which is a which is a 3B. Um, I normally have one that's a little bit harder than that, but I want to make some dark marks so you can see the pencil lines. Now, I explained to you about the photograph using artistic license. Perhaps prior to my starting the demo, I can just emphasize uh, to you that I always make sure to determine the light direction at the very beginning of the painting. It's so important to determine that light direction at the start and that you don't change that at any time throughout the painting. If you changed it, I can assure you, you will lose the effect totally that we're trying to achieve and you will spoil your painting. You must decide on the light, the direction of it and stick to it. In fact, on my little biro sketch, I put a pencil mark on an arrow there to emphasize that just to, to remind me as well as remind you. So, the light is coming from the left. Okay, now before we make a start, just quickly show you my palette. This is my palette. These are the colors, eight colors. I think again, I've mentioned this to you and the uh, handouts. Uh, quickly, raw sienna, burnt umber, burnt sienna, uh, Venetian red, light red, alizarin crimson, cobalt blue, Winds of Blue Green Shade and Ultramarine Blue. This is Horses, 140 pounds, rough textured Horses paper, uh, 15 by 11, quarter imperial. Looks a little bit cockle, but don't worry about that. Um, I like to use my metal palette. Uh, by all means, use whatever you feel appropriate. But uh, I've had this for many years. This was a, made by Craig Young. You may have heard of that gentleman there. He's quite, uh, quite famous chap. These are my brushes. Uh, again, I suggested that we use a 14, 16 uh, sable, squirrel, whatever you prefer to use. It's a round pointed brush. Um, this is a long handled one. Uh, which I like to use because I can hold it right back, almost like a if you were throwing a dart. Uh, if you get too close to your brush here, then what that does, it restricts your movement and also it makes you start to fiddle. Whereas if you hold it nice and back here, you have more freedom and uh, I, I find it much better and encourage that. We've got a uh, this is a rigger, a number three rigger, which I use on occasion, just probably right at the very end of the painting, just to indicate one or two lines. 
Um, and I have a, a bit of a mop brush. This is only a fairly small one uh, relative. It's, it's for the size of painting, and this is what I'm going to use for the sky. For the size of painting, uh, this is ideal. If I go bigger in size of, of paper, then I go up in size in terms of brush, as you can see. And if I go up to full imperial, I'll go up to something like that. So you can see the brushes that you use should be pro raw to the, to the size of paper that you're painting on. Um, if you have too small of a brush, you have to make lots of little marks. Whereas one bigger brush can make just one mark, which is much better for a watercolour. If you make too many marks, the little pigments will get disturbed and it'll show in the, the grain of the sediments of the paint in some of the paints that we use. So let's make a start. Here we go. I've got one quick question, please. Someone's okay. asking what's the closest blue to Windsor? Trevor. What? Repeat that, please. What's the closest blue to Windsor blue? Oh, that was cobalt blue. Cobalt, yeah. cobalt right. blue. Cobalt. Okay. Very expensive cobalt blue. Very expensive. Okay. I buy my uh, paints, uh, Windsor and Newton professional quality. I've always used this, uh, this particular one. Uh, it's the most expensive one, but it's in my mind, it's the best one, but there are many out there that uh, that can be used. But uh, I had much success from this, and and I just know exactly what these colours do, uh, how they respond to each other. Some colours like each other, and they're attracted to each other. Some colours don't like each other for some reason, and they push away from each other. So this is what you can use to your advantage. And if you buy them in tubes they're already guppy uh, like butter so it's uh, nicely flows onto your paper straight away so here we go right i'm going to establish now uh, the eye level of the the little man which will be about here uh, and i'm going to have a vanishing point roughly about here uh, let's see because i want the direction of these uh, these buildings to come down sharply. So I'm going to bring these down quickly like this. The more we bring them down quickly, the more we exaggerate it. I'm going to bring the, the the hillside behind quite high up. Now I'm not going to put this lamp post in this time. Uh, I think that's too fiddly for the uh, for the demonstration. So here we go. Now we're going to bring the wall down. We've got the got the windows. Let's see an odd window in. Doesn't matter being in, exactly in the right place. Uh, and then these come down like this way. So we've got windows here. And we've got a big door, and big barn door here. Uh, and we want the, the wall to come down here. And we want it to reach about, uh, about here, perhaps. Uh, have the gate perhaps about there. And bring this over here. And we'll take it down. We have a gap in the wall where the sheep have broke through and a uh, little wall down this side. And really, that's about the only pencil marks that I would make. That's about only the pencil marks I would make. You can go fiddling and doing more. You don't need to put the trees in or anything like that. Right, so I'm going to put this. I'm going to put this down now because it's only a, my reference Fermi pencil drawing. Here we go. Now the first thing I'm going to do 
In this instance, is the sky. The sky sets the mood on a landscape, in my opinion. Uh, on the photograph, it's, well, it's a beautiful blue sky with the odd clouding. Well, to, although it's very bright and I want to create some light effect, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the sky very moody. Very moody. Okay. So, let me get my, my little mop. This little mop's a, a squirrel mop, I think it is. Yes, yeah, squirrel. My brushes, I always used to use Kalinsky Stable. Um, they're more expensive, but they are beautiful brushes uh, and they're very gentle with the paint on the paper. They don't push hard into the paper like some man made fibre brushes do. Uh, sable is very gentle, similar squirrel as well, even even softer. Gently lay the paint on the paper. Don't be too don't be too uh, harsh with the with that when you're applying the paint on the paper. Here we go. Now I'm building up I'm building up uh, adrenaline to uh, to get going, and I'm going to start with with a little bit of raw sienna, a very weak mix of raw sienna. Very weak mix of raw sienna. I'm going to fill my brush up, deciding that the light is coming from the left. So I'm going to make this darker to sort of balance the weight of this paint in here. And I'm going to make it quite dark. And I'm going to take the, the sky right down to this level here. Okay. And now I'm going to mix some ultramarine blue and light red. Let's try some light red. You'll see I'm folding the colors together. Here we go. All on the top of the paper there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just bring some of this down now with my brush. Get a little bit of the raw sienna and just bring that down a little bit. I can get some of my cobalt blue. Drop this in here. And the thing is with skies is not to fiddle. Not to fiddle. I'm going to soften, soften this edge here. And this edge here. But what you can do with the use of when you're using um, ultramarine blue, it's a it's a granulating uh, it's a granulating uh, color. And if you want it to granulate even more, if you tap beside you, tap your like this, what it does, it makes the little sediments settle down, settle down onto the paper gently, and it creates granulation.
Right, now I'm not going to do any more to that sky at this moment in time. I'm very tempted to go in with a little bit darker. Just a little bit darker. Shall I do that? Yeah, let me go in with it a little bit darker. Same mix, but a little bit darker. And a little less water. Let's see. Oh, that is dark. Okay, now then we're going to move over onto the building now. Now I'm, I'm purposely painting quite slowly at the moment. I usually work much faster, but I'm trying to keep it uh, so I can explain things as I go along. Now I'm going to work on this left hand side here. And I'm going to do this building. Now we want the light to be catching this this building, but I'm going to put a bit of colour in. Raw sienna and a little bit of light red. Here we go. Now they're what they call coins, coins on this side here. So I want to come down and I'm mindful of what I want to leave white on the paper. Okay. Soften that edge there. Now I'm going to move over onto this part here, the shadow side of the building. Let's keep the, the same theme, but this time burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. You'll see I'm folding the colours in, I'm not mixing it up like a cup of tea. Let's put a little bit of lizard in. Warm that up a little bit. Right, here we go. And if I put some cobalt blue in that, it's a little bit cooler, makes it cooler, because what I want to do is I want to go a bit further away. This time I'm over here. I've left the white of the paper just on that gutter at the top for the light to catch it. So all the time I'm thinking about ways of achieving light. Now I'm going to put this, uh, I'm going to put some burnt sienna in here because there's a, there's a tree here. Light in there. Now I'm going to go in burnt sienna, ultramarine. I have an habit of putting brush in my mouth. Now I'm going to put these windows in. Lights coming from the left. I 
Okay. Now I'm going to introduce a little bit more colour now, wet in wet. A little bit of raw sienna here. Just dropping it in very loosely. You can see how I'm holding the brush. It's not always with the point, I use the side of the brush as well. What was that there? Must have caught it with my jumper. Put my jumper up there. Right, let's go move on to the wall. I want the tops of the wall catching the light. So I want to use raw sienna. Burnt umber, and I'm going to just make a suggestion of some of the capstar light on top of the wall there, and in and in places. Remember the light catching the top of this wall here, so I've got to remember that as well. And bring it down to this rough edge here, which is where the grass field is here. Now I can get some burnt, burnt umber and ultramarine, and just drop that in in places. Wet in wet. I've heard that term before, wet in wet. Now I'm going to come on this side here. Now this side is in shadow, whereas this side is catching the light a little bit more. This side's going to be in shadow, so it can be even darker still. So we'll use some of this. Yeah. I'm going to go around. to be a little bit further over. I can go over there. I can put some burnt sienna in here, this foreground here. I'm going to work on this side now. And this side's catching the light because the light's going from this way. So we're going to put some suggestions of the wall in here but just much lighter so i'm going to be use cobalt blue and burnt umber which makes a nice gray but let's see i'll put it about there let's put Right, now I'm going to just put some, some, a few more little marks in. Keep putting the brush in me, man. Somebody said, well, I was told 40 years ago that it, it would put me, that it would not do me any good, but I'm still living. So, so far. Although I don't want to. Right. Now I'm looking at the sky, and the sky is drying out nicely. And if I get down, if I get down like this, I can see the sheen on the paper, and that's telling me whether it's dry enough to put the next layer of paint on or not. And if there's a sheen there, if it's shiny, then it's too wet. You just want it to look a little bit more dry than it is. Watercolour is all about timing. Moving about here, there and everywhere on your paper if necessary. Depending on the style, of course, how you paint. Some people just paint in washes right across and then they lay the washes up. 
Mine, I suppose, is more what you would call in blocks of colour, you might say. Here we go. I've forgot this. Uh, this money here. Let's get this in. Right. Now I'm going to move over now. I want to. I want to get that hillside in, but it's still a little bit wet. What I'm going to do is just put some raw sand in here. I'm just going to, if you're mixing a green with only the yellow that I have, which is raw sienna, you put raw sienna in your palette first, in your mixing bowl, and then introduce the blue afterwards. If you do it the other way, then you end up it being too, having to put too much yellow in because you've put too much blue in. It's easy to put a little bit of blue in the yellow than it is to put yellow in the blue. Now that, does that make sense? I don't know if it does, but that just makes a nice green. Just nice, that. I'm going to counter change the, uh, the, uh, the uh, gateway. Still looking at that. Now, I've not mentioned about the fact that I've got two buckets of water down here. You can just about make them out in your, uh, just just down here in front of me. One's for mucky and one's for clean. So I'm um, saving the clean one for when I, want, when I want to mix a nice clean wash. Which I'm going to do in a minute. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a bit of clean water A little bit of clean water, just about there. And I'm going to mix the ultra marine and light red. That's very dark. That's very dark, but it'll be very effective. Let's see now. A little bit of raw sienna in that. I'm going to soften that now. What color was that yellow mixed with? It's raw sienna, it's the yellow. It's raw sienna. I'm just going to put a bit more. I only just use one yellow. So it was just raw sienna? Correct? Raw. Okay. It's all starting to counter change now. Now then, how are we doing for time? Quarter past three. Oh, that should be all right. Uh, let's do a little bit more. Let's just do a little bit more. Well, that's drying out. A little bit more around here. And dropping a little bit of colour on here. What you don't want is too regimented.
get some darks in here. This one wants to be really dark here. Let's see now. I'm going to put some green in there. Nice, nice raw sienna. In that mix that I had before. And I'm going to dry brush across if I can. I want to make sure I mi just miss the edge of this brick, this stone wall here, so that the light's catching the top of the catching the top of these stones. And this one here. We can put some of that green. Or here. Right. Now this is where I can start putting in some little darks, just to emphasize good to detail in places which we don't want to do too much of. And last night I cut my nails. And I like, and, and so I'm not, I don't my fingernails, I cut my nails last night, so. Just to suggest that. I'm going to put some, because this is in shadow, this wall is in shadow because the light's coming this way. I'm going to make this a little bit darker. To suggest this. And go up. And this and on this side, we've got the the light catching the. The vegetation on that side. Right, I'm going to just make a little bit more. And it's pretty tempting to start fiddling when you see lots of stones like this, but you'll know, stop yourself from fiddling. Just do it very selectively. Right. There are some trees behind here. Uh, I suppose it would help to counter change the uh, counter change the the farm building.
This is where you can use your rigger quickly to just put some uh, twigs in, uh, branches in, but they're so far away, you can't really see it every individual branch. So you only do the odd one or two, that's all. We've had the same brush all the way through up to now. Now then, it's still a bit wet. I want to start putting in the shadows. But I can't yet because it's too wet. What I'm going to do, I'm going to pick out this, the dark side of, of this bush here. This bush here. So all the time I'm looking for more objects to catch in the light and then the shadow side of the object being much darker. So up there should be a bit darker there. That's it. Right. Can I go in with the shadow yet? No. So what I'll do is I'll put the I'll put the man in. Shall I put the man in? Let's get some figures in. Let's put some figures in while it's drying out. Uh, where do I position the figures? Well, I want to put that little man in. Does it need a figure in? Yeah. I'll put the little man in first. A little farmer that sat at his... Uh, went against the gate. So we've got ultramarine, burnt sienna, and a little bit of alizarin crimson, just to warm it up a little bit. And because of very little water, very little water. Now, now let's get this right, because we don't want it to look out of scale. And that is still wet there, which I'm impatient. I'm terrible when it comes to uh, being impatient, but uh, here we go. Yeah, that's about right, scale-wise. Yeah, that's about right, scale-wise. Now then, we need to put some shadows in here. We need to get some shadows. And the shadow mix is ultramarine blue, white, red. Ultramarine blue and white, red. Ultramarine blue, white, red. Scoop up some water. Uh, I'm going to gently lay that on top. And you should be able to just do it so gently it doesn't disturb the paint underneath. And then I'm going to bring it down to the tops of that wall there. Same with this one here. And you'll see that I'm making the brush marks in the direction. A little bit of reflected light there on that doorway. And around there, and bringing it down. And a little bit of light catching that, that, that edge, that shadow from that wall. And then I'm going to bring this down here. Just 
And that stonework's going to counter change there against that dark. Look how that sparkles in that area there. Right. Nearly finished. Nearly finished. Just got to put some shadows in, a few marks. Now, this is this wall is going to cast a shadow across. So I've got to put a, a shadow in. And again, that's ultramarine blue, light red. This time, with a little bit of raw sienna in it, which will make it a little bit greener. So it's light red, ultramarine, with some raw sienna. It's quite, it's quite dark. What I'm going to do is pick up some clean water. And they've got to determine the, the height of an object, the position of the light of the sun in the sky will determine the length of the shadow. So if the light is coming at, say, 45 degrees, this is an easy rule of thumb. If it's coming at 45 degrees and the wall is say four foot high, it'll cast a shadow four foot long. Does that make sense? I think it does. So this wall is about, relative to this chap here, is about three foot six, four foot. So we'll go like this and we'll take it across to there and then we'll bring it and we'll gradually make it longer and taller. And then it goes back down small again because the wall's been taken down, so it only comes to there. We've got the chap there that is going to cast a shadow. Now we've got this wall here that I need to just pick out. And this is in shadow here as well on this side, but I'm just going to weaken this a little bit more. Let's bring that shadow across there. Shadows that help to lead the viewer into the painting. Strong tones in the foreground. Now I'm going to use my, my rigger now to, to put some of these posts in. On, the, uh, on this one, on the original one, I think as well, there's these posts. And what they do, uh, when the sheep knock the, the walls over, they... The former, if he can't get a dry stone over to do it quickly, or if he has time to do it himself, he'll put some posts in and then put some barbed wire across, uh, or some other means of stopping the sheep from getting out. Well, those, I think, will just help to lead the eye into the painting, and uh, just creates a little bit of interest. So we'll put, we'll put them in. Uh, now, I should, I was, I'll see if I can do it with this big brush. How are we doing for time? It's half past three. We want to go to nowhere. Right, let's see if we can get this. Here we go. Ultramarine blue. It's neat. I don't know water on my brush. You'll notice I'm flicking like this with my brush. And what that, do, what that does, it regulates the amount of water on my brush. It's an habit I've got into. Some people have a sponge at side. Um, some might use a little bit of tissue paper to regulate the amount of water on the brush. Uh, it is very important to get that just right. Um, what I discourage, or try to discourage, is, is having the tissue paper in your hand all the time, because what can happen is, if you're a little bit nervous about putting paint on paper, 
you can end up putting the paint on your brush and then just before you put it on your paper, you start dabbing your tissue paper because you, you want you feel there's so much paint on your brush. So you end up, all the bright paint that you've put on your brush that should be going on your paper is going onto your tissue paper. Be brave enough to put it onto your painting because that's what watercolours are about. It's about getting paint on the paper and flooding the paper and being, being bold. Here we go, let's get this. Uh, I'm gonna take it right up there. And they, and they sort of go at different angles sometimes. Let's put, and then we're gonna put some on this side as well. Sometimes they go down front of the, uh, as well, as well as behind. Now I'll get my rigger. I know this is a bit fiddly, but get me rigger. Ultramarine and burnt sienna again. Light butter down. And if I just Fiddling, I'm starting to fiddle. Okay, nearly finished now. Nearly finished. I just want to put a little bit more shadow in for that uh, post I've just put in. That's that again, this is a lot to lead the viewer's eye into the painting. Uh, that's a bit too, too, too warm. No, that's too much. It's about right. Uh, you can see the colours, how they're separating. I'm not swishing them up like a cup of tea. I'm just folding them gently into each other. So this... Uh, Right. I don't know to put some figures in like I did before. Uh, what you can do, you can, uh, this post here is catching the light. So on that left hand side, I've just scratched the paint off to highlight that side of the, the, the post. This side here is, I don't do many gimmicky things but uh, and I'm just going to make a few marks here in the foreground on this on this piece of vegetation here uh, not too much just to be careful doing too much of that right last bit Last bit. The hardest bit is to stop. Knowing when to stop. And I think I'll stop there. Oh no, I can't because I've got that gate to put in. We're rushing, I'm missing some of the little bits that need to be done. Again, the light direction, taking advantage of where I put the, the marks. I can see the white there. Then little bits of white I've left, so I'm going to put the, the five bar gear, which is what it is. Uh, and I'm going to use the white. Right. I think that's it. 
Let's see what it looks like with Mount Rat. I'm pleased with that. Um, I've not worried too much about the the hill in the background be, being uh, standing out because it would be too much to have that totally strong. It, it needs to be distant, which it is, and it's lost in the, the storm of the clouds. But the light is coming this way, uh, and uh, I think that's that's really emphasis. This white of the paper, that, it looks nice on the screen. Uh, when I say that, I'm, I'm not meaning that because I'm boasting about my own painting, but it, but it's important to look at your, your work and see it. Uh, sometimes it's a good thing to hold it up against the mirror. If you're ever doing portraits, hold it, your portrait up against the mirror and that will show the uh, whether it's working or not. Um, Okay, right. That's my pencil drawing. So we get our get our mop brush because we're going to put uh, uh, the sky in first. And what we're going to do is we're going to put raw sienna down to the approximate eye level, which is about there, halfway down your paper. And uh, Trevor, then, can we can we pin that what you're working on and get rid of your screen share? Would that work? Sorry, repeat that. Well, I'm going to remove. There we go. Okay, okay, I've done it. It's all right. No problem. I've done it. Okay, okay. So we should be able to see that. Okay, so we've raw sienna, and we're going to make brush strokes that go up from this eye level or horizon, whichever, and we're going to make the brush strokes go up like this in this direction. And then with clean water, we can wet this area at the top a little bit, soften the edges, and mix some ultramarine blue and light red. Ultramarine blue and light red. Now my palette's very mucky, so hopefully I can uh, do this. Ultramarine and light red. Needs to be quite watery. It wants to be stronger than the previous wash that you put on. And what we're going to do is we're going to go from the top and make brush strokes down. And if we make those brush strokes touch touch the raw sienna, what will happen is that the, it'll pull it down. It'll start to pull it down. You see how it's starting to run down? If, you're, if your board is set at about 10, 15 degrees, it should start to go down. And then what you can do is get your raw sienna and just go up to leave the white of the paper and just let it run down. Just let it run down. And what it'll do, it'll drag, it'll drag the light red down with it. It should do, that's in your mix. And if you want to, you can just soften the edges. Just soften one or two of the edges so we don't have them looking like spaceships. <laughs> that go right down there. 
Trevor, can I stop you for one moment? Yeah. People are having trouble seeing what you're doing. Can you stop sharing your screen? Yeah. And um, so they'll just look at what you're working on. Can they not see that? That some people are having trouble seeing um, what you're painting. So can is you that stop? because they're not pinned? Are they not pinned that particular? I'm not sure. Yeah, um, they, they but, must... but they're having trouble. So can you stop sharing? The other the stage. I have done that. that yeah, I've stopped. Okay, that's good. You can pin it and it'll work. Yeah, good. Pin it. That that's be great. For everybody now. Thank you. Thank you. That's perfect yeah. now. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so you can so you can see me now and you can see the painting now, can't you? Hopefully. Yes. That's Excellent. It. Perfect. Oh. So we'll give people just a moment or two to get that in. Because the sky is, I mean, it's very important, but it's something that you mustn't labour over. It's something that's done very, very quickly. It's very tempting to, to do a little bit more and to put a little bit here and a little bit there, but just do it very quickly and leave it. It's much better that you leave it to work, let the colours work themselves. I'll just give you another couple of seconds. We're okay, it's on it. Are we actually governed to exactly the time scale, Lois? Uh, no, it's fine. You can go over. Don't worry. Okay. Don't okay. Care. okay. I'm just thinking if they want to slightly go over in case we have to. Is that all right? I mean, it'll only be fractional, hopefully, but everybody's works at different speeds, you see, so it's very, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, and it's, I can recall, I mean, when I was at school, because I'm, I'm dyslexic, as soon as the teacher said something, uh, everybody else had finished and I'd still be trying to work it out. And that's where I got left behind and, and struggled. So I, I, I can... I can appreciate if some are finding it a little bit more difficult than others. This is not gin and tonic, it's water. Okay. All right, so we'll move on to, let's do this wall on the left-hand side now. And um, what I'm going to do, oh, I forgot to put me, I forgot to put my chimney in. But never mind, I can soon do that. And don't worry about your pencil lines. Now, try not to be too worried that your pencil lines are not exactly right. You're not painting to them like boundary lines. They're only there to guide you. You can put your brush marks wherever you choose. When the painting is finished and is thoroughly dry, then you can remove those pencil marks that you don't want to keep. So we'll put some raw sienna. Let's put some raw sienna on the building now. And we're just gonna roughly get it in and leave, leave the windows. Don't worry too much about them coins. Uh, on the corner, the white coins, uh, they're a feature of these type of buildings. But, uh, but it's important that you leave the tops of this wall, this wall that's coming down here, just make sure that you leave the tops staggered. Uh, you know, just stagger them. Same with this one here up here. How is everybody with that? You're in, you're in charge of the chat from people if they if they want me to slow down or go they, fast. They, they everyone's still sort of commenting about how they got they couldn't see your screen, but we I think we're all sorted now. It's okay. Okay. Good. 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 Uh, 
Okay. Now then, we'll put some marks in now for the windows and just to highlight some of the darks. For example, the, the verge, which is where the slates come over, uh, and the gutters, and the windows and doors, perhaps. And we can use a dark colour, whatever you want to choose. You can use ultramarine and burnt sienna, which is a, a darkest dark probably you can get. Um, or you can use ultramarine and burnt umber. You know, it doesn't really matter as long as it's nice and dark. I'm going to go, and when you're doing windows, don't worry about them being exactly in the right place. And, and, it, and if you're using your photographs for reference, don't think you've got to put every window in or every door that's shown on your, on your, on your painting, uh, on, your, on your photograph as well. Just suggestion. And if you do a stroke, just one stroke down. It doesn't matter if you got it exactly right. It's just a suggestion. And the barn door here. Let's get the barn door in. So them darks we're using, we're almost like pencil drawing, aren't we, in a way? But it, what it's just doing is just shaping, shaping the, the objects a little bit more for you to follow. And it's a mess. When you put in lines in, don't start at the beginning and go all the way along to the end in one go. Do a little bit and then miss a little bit and then do a little bit more, miss a little bit more. And, and it's far more effective. Let, let the viewer fill the gaps. Far more interesting if you let the viewer fill the gaps. I'll put the chimney pots in. A chimney pot, chimney stack. Okay. Now we're going to do the shadow side, the shadow side of these buildings, because the light is coming from, from this direction here. Coming from here. Remember, keep that in your mind and remember what objects are going to be caught by the light and what are going to be in shadow. So let's get this mix here, which is hmm, burnt sienna. Let's go for burnt sienna, ultramarine. Burnt sienna, ultramarine. And just leave the odd bit of white of the paper for round the windows. Just to get you sometimes get a little bit of reflective light. Remember, we're going to put a, we're going to put a shadow, um, a shadow. Can't think of a word. Glaze over these uh, objects that are in shadow.
remember to do as few brush strokes as you can. That's why I'm using the, the brush on its side as well as the point. Because if I put the, if I just use the point, I've got to make lots of marks like this all the way down. Whereas if I go it on my side, I can do it almost in one go. Again, remember to leave don't have hard edges at bottom who want to want them sort of irregular. I'm gonna make that just a little bit warmer. Yeah. This is for some areas that are still wet, you can drop in a warm colour, say light red into the part of the building that's nearer to you. Like there, that's nearer to you, and and a little bit of blue in the areas that's a little bit further away, because that's how you create aerial perspective. You get a few warm colours bring objects near to you, cool colours take the objects away. Doing all right. Everybody seems to be doing all right. It's very difficult to work very fast if you're not used to it. But people said to me, I want to paint a little bit more looser. Uh, and one of the ways that helps is to just speed up. Set yourself a time limit to complete a painting. That doesn't mean you you uh, go willy nilly and make a mess and not think about what you're doing. You've still got to think about what you're doing. Are you not having a go, Lois? No, I'm hey. not. <laughs> <laughs> I've made a little sketch for later. Okay. <laughs> I'd love to have a go. I will have a go in the fullness of time. Yeah, yeah. Right, I'm going to put some of these uh, suggestion of, of stonework in this wall coming down here and then along this front edge here. So that's the next stage that we're going to work for, that work to. And uh, I don't know if people are ready for that stage, but uh, forgive me if I'm pushing you too much, but We're using very few colours in this painting, believe it or not. There's only four or five colours that we're actually using. So, you know, it keeps it, keeps it all together. Um, sometimes you can use a vibrant colour to your advantage in your painting if you want to bring the viewer's eye back one way or the other from the painting. If it's too heavy on one side, you can put a vibrant colour on the opposite side and it will counterbalance. Uh, right, ultramar up, raw sienna and burnt umber. Be a little bit of a little bit of ultramarine in some clean water. Now let's do this this wall again. So we're going to. Leave some of the white of the paper. Remember this wall here, the tops of this wall we want to leave as well.
And we can drop some colours in that a little bit of if we want to, a little bit of raw sienna, a little bit of light red if we want to. You can just don't do too much of that, just carefully. The add place just to break up the monotony of the colour. Then we want to come into the foreground here. And that's going to be in shadow, so it wants to be a little bit darker, even though we're going to put a shadow over afterwards, a shadow glaze. We can still make it slightly darker. Um, ultramarine, Rosalie, and then Pentumber. Oh, that's far too, far too strong, but uh, we'll see how we go on. I'm going to soften this edge here. It's very difficult to do a teaching when you can't uh, when you can't see them, and you can't. This is the frustration I get sometimes. Um, yes, there's no feedback, is there? Sorry about that. <laughs> well, it, it, at the best of times, I, I find it uh, hard to. You know, show people and follow them what they're doing and try and help them. Um, the fact that I can't help them physically it makes it a little bit more difficult. Never mind. Well, that's the darker side. Uh, Can you explain what the shadow on the wall of the house was? What colours are used for that? Here, yeah, well, we haven't actually done a shadow yet, but we've put a darker tone of colour in, and that's the the colour of the stonework, which will be perhaps ultramarine blue with burnt umber or with a little bit of burnt sienna in it. So we want a little bit brownie, um, brownie grey. And what I did, I introduced a little bit of warmth in this, this one at the front, with dropping in some light red uh, whilst it was still wet. And on this one, I, I put a little bit of ultramarine blue in, which has cooled it off. Uh, but when I put a shadow over, uh, it'll tone, it'll be together more and uh, and it will look okay. Let's get to, let's put this all in here. Taking it to the next stage. Let's put some green in here. Remember to leave the white on these stone tops here. And around this one in the foreground here. He wants his tea. No, my my, uh, my wife just been for my grandson, and she's come back. Uh, and my dog can hear the car arriving on the driveway, so she'll be going absolutely ballistic while she comes in. Because my lovely wife, she when she comes in, she makes a right fuss at dog, so it gets it's got really all gets all worked up, and I try to discourage it because. You shouldn't really greet them too much when they can <laughs> still go mad in a minute. Oh, it's not so bad as you know. How's everybody doing with this with this painting? Are they are they are they 
get in by, are we? Is yeah. any, any comments from anybody? Yeah, I think okay. people are happy. Yeah. Is that that's uh, Diana? Are you all right, Diana? Have a good day, uh, Diane. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Good. Good. You're doing just fine, Trevor. <laughs> Don't worry about all this other nonsense. Okay. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you very much. I'm going too fast for you. My apologies. Okay. I'm going to drop in that little bit of uh, uh, burnt sienna on that on that uh, tree. Uh, I'm going to put it there. Like that. It's a little bit central in the paper, but uh, don't don't have to put it in if you don't want. But it just helps to come to change. And of course, we've got this bit of grass here in the foreground, which uh, I quite like the idea of dropping some warmth in there. And whilst it's there, we can just put a little bit here. The thing is with the... Um, when you're following a, a demonstration or doing an exercise like this, you're you're not really uh, you're not creating being creative. You're just learning the techniques, aren't you? You're just learning where to put the paint, and that's always the difficult bit is knowing where to put the paint. But what you must try and force yourself to do is to not always uh, always uh, you know co uh, not copy but uh, use other people's work as reference too much try and experiment with your own ideas try and be more creative really and um, adventurous um, otherwise it, it it just won't, you won't be able to, you won't move on really. You won't progress. You'll, don't, if you keep painting other artists' work, and, then you'll, you'll, you'll not be, for, you'll not be, a, for, you know, pushing yourself. That's the word I'm looking for. You've got to push yourself. I'm looking at me. I'm looking at me uh, in mountain in the back, and uh, it's not really dry yet. But I'm going to, I'm going to mix some light red and ultramarine for this for this uh, hillside at the back. My palette's very mucky at the moment. I've got a, I've got a lovely picture of, of Bonnie. Uh, she's, she's got pride and place on my uh, computer. <laughs> oh, it's, it's fascinating watching you, it's concentrating. <laughs> yeah. Right now, I'm going to put this put this color in. Let's see, it's going to be very powerful. Uh, there we go. Wow, that is, that is powerful. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to soften that top edge. Soften it. Wet in went there. Bringing it down. Can you say, repeat what the colour of the mountain was? What colours did you it, use? Ultramarine and light red. Ultramarine and light red. Because what it's doing, it's, it's reflecting the colours of the clouds that are, that are covering them. Just 
just in the background, really. We don't, we're not trying to, we could double, we could perhaps have a, just one hard edge there, perhaps. And, and I'm going to. It's all running into each other there, but I'm not panicking. Sometimes it's happy accidents happen, let them happen. How are we doing for time? Quarter past. Another quarter of an hour and after that, for as long as it takes. I'm just going to go into this area that's dried out a little bit and just put some suggestion of. Uh, of colour or, or texture into some of these stones and just to break up the monotony of that wall going down. Right now, that's very wet there. I've got to try and take some of that out, or else I'll be able to get the shadow in. Now, the shadows are very important and really should only be done right at the very end. That's, that's the best thing, really. Um, I'm going to put the figure in. Is anybody, are you ready for putting the figure in or not? Figures are... Yeah, go for it, Trevor. Yeah, okay. It's got a figure in. In fact, what I'll do is I'll put a bigger one in this time. Yeah, can, you can... When you download the edited video of the exercise, you can practice putting other figures in or whatever you want to do. But this time I'm just going to put a, a couple of figures in. Show you how I'm going to do that. Uh, ultramarine, burnt sienna, alizarin crimson. Uh, if you want to watch how I do this, the light direction is coming from the left. So we've got, let's see, put it here. Unfortunately, the head's going to be not in the light that I want, but let's see. In fact, we'll have two people. And join them together. Join them together. They like being together. <laughs> they want to be together. And we've got a lady. Uh, we've got a lady. Well, there could be two ladies if we wanted. Uh, but we'll have a gent. We'll have a gent. Put pants on.
Moving on. Lovers walking down the lane. Right. We're nearly at the point where we're going to put some shadows in. Where I am. Uh, I don't know how you people are. She looks very elegant to be walking on a country road, Trevor. Yeah, she is a bit, isn't she? Yeah, well, we have some elegant ladies around here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> she's out courting, so she's looking the part. She's looking the part, isn't she? Right, we're going to get some shadows in now. Right, shadows, ultramarine light red. I'll keep it simple. Uh, ultramarine and light red. And what we're going to do is we're going to go over with a very, very gently, we're not going to brush or into the paint, we're just going to lay this glaze on top. Now mine is absolutely wet through around here, so, but I can't, I can't hang on. So I'm going to put ultramarine and light red. It's very hard to get that Right consistency of ultramarine and light red. What you want, you want it not too strong, but you want it not too weak. Uh, and you need some clean water. Right. I'm going to put this on very gently. And I'm going to try and leave some of the I've lost the white already in that. Put it down there. And if I bring it down to there and it's running down there but never mind and then i've got to take it to there and then bring it down there like that and then that one is dark Very hard to do the shadows. Uh, you, could, you should really wait till it's relatively dry. If you're not, uh, if you don't know, if you've not lots of practice at doing it when it's wet, which uh, even I get a struggle sometimes. But I've managed to do it. Yeah, she does look elegant, doesn't she? Yeah. <laughs> I think he's got himself a locker there. <laughs> right. Last few strokes now. We're getting nearly, we're getting nearly there, actually. I don't know how everybody else is doing, but uh, let's get that. And we're going to put some the same shadow mix, ultramarine and light red. Not keep it, not complicate it. Not complicate it. If, if you want to, you can introduce a tiny, tiny little bit of raw sienna. A tiny, tiny bit of raw sienna. Ooh. Here we go. And it's the shadow side of this wall that I'm doing. Use the point of your brush.
Now you think you've lost all the colour underneath, but what happens when you put a glaze over the top of another colour? If you've done it gently enough, what will happen, rather than the colour underneath being disturbed and mixing with the glaze that you've put on top, it'll stop where it is. And as the top glaze dries out, the colour underneath will start to show through. That's the, that's the idea, that's the principle. We've got... Uh, let's put the shadow on this, these figures, because they'll cast a shadow as well. And remember that principle of 45 degree angle, if the light in the sky is 45, if they're five foot six tall, then the shadow is going to be equally length, equal length. So I'll take the shadow, just take it up there like that. Yeah. How are we doing, everybody? I'm okay. Can't hear. I can't hear anybody. Everyone looks happy. No one's broken down in tears or anything. <laughs> yeah. That could be me and my wife. That. <laughs> Yeah, that's nice, that. Someone's asking, when you talk about a glaze, what is that compared to a wash? Well, it's similar. Um, I would, hmm, what's the difference? I would say a glaze is... It's a little bit more of a gentle application and a little bit weaker. Um, it's a, that's a good question, that. There's probably not much difference, but I call it a glaze. But there is a difference. It's, it's, it's just picking the right... A glaze is like picking the, the mix that will enhance the colour that's underneath. A wash is almost like where you're almost going over another colour to, to cover it up, in a way. Um, not necessarily right, but that's the that's best way I can explain it, perhaps from my point of view. Uh, I call it a glaze. Uh, well, that's a good question, now. I'm going to soften that edge there. Soften all this edge here. Too much colour, too much. And I'm just going to make just a few suggestions of darks here, just, just to lead the viewer's eye into the painting and create a little bit of an impact next to the light of the white of the paper and same here. Got to put them posts in there, all them sheep will get through that gap, that's for sure. Right, how are we doing? Oh, we... Last few remarks now, I'm just going to put this uh, these posts in and then we'll call it, call it. A day, I think. Uh, 
this one just a bit because it's still wet here. I'm gonna have to do this very strong, very strong mix. The beauty of the beauty of um, the, the tube paints is that you can apply them neat uh, with very little water. So, so you can actually go over a, a wetter area. Uh, Let's put a dry brush. I know we put the lamp post in, did we? It would. Uh, it could be a feature. It's actually there, you know. And sometimes things like that are. Uh, sort of create a little bit of um, uh, interest sometimes. You don't want it to be looking ugly, um, but it can be uh, if it's a character of a of a location uh, and people recognise uh, the object as being a, a local object. Then, then yeah, you can put things in that are a little bit quirky. Um, I'm thinking of, say, like uh, time posts and things like that. Sometimes there's way, way posts pointing in a certain direction. Uh, we have them around here, you know, footpath signs. Somebody might be familiar with that particular walk, for example, and, and they can relate to being stood near an object that's, uh, that, that's a little bit different. I'm just going to put... Right, let's get these uh, a bit more, bits more solid then, aren't they? Gotta be careful of uh, doing too much of this thing. Yeah. And then we'll just put that shadow across from that post. And then we'll call up that idea. I quite like all the white. Uh, it's what you leave out, as I said before, is, uh, is sometimes uh, more interesting than what you leave in. Um, it lets the viewer put, it lets the viewer put, use their imagination. You know, if you tell everybody, if you tell the viewer everything, then they soon get fed up of the painting. Uh, it's like a photograph. And, and so if it's, if it's uh, left a little bit to the imagination of the viewer, you don't get bored with it. And they see something different each time, perhaps. Right. Um, we'll have a questions and answers, I think. What do you do with me? Oh, it's here. Someone was, asked, someone was asking if you could put a tree in. I beg your pardon? Someone was asking if you could put a tree in. Put a tree in? Oh, oh well. Uh, yeah, I can do, yeah. I'm just, the thing is, I've lost the, the white, what I would have liked to have left. But a tree, where can we work? Can we put a tree? If we put, we don't want to put it dead center. Yeah. We could put one here. We could put one here. But let's have a say. I've lost the light, so this is quite dark here. The only way I could do that. The only way I could do that would to put some darker trees in distance, for example. Uh, let's say uh, burnt umber, an ultramarine. Let's try, perhaps put something here to counter change. 
Can you start? Can you start, Edge? I wouldn't want to do much else, really, otherwise it's making it too busy then. But uh, if they want to put a tree in, you know, they, they can do it. I think what there was a, a tree behind the roof on one of your Oh, editions. yeah, with the, oh, with the trees behind. Of course, yeah. Oh, we can do that, yeah. Well, let's make this a bit darker here. Once I put that in, we can, yeah, we can do these trees here. Um, and we want a very, uh, a very dry brush for doing this. Um, I'll use some of these colour here, which is quite brown, a bit more blue in it. And you use the edge of your brush uh, and make the brush strokes go down like a fan into the shape of the, the tree that you want. But you have to be very careful. It's good to practice on a piece of paper if you're not used to it. And um, let's try. Remember where the light's coming from. Yeah. Don't do any more to it than that because you can start fiddling and it draws the viewer's eye to that then. Uh -huh. uh, sometimes you need to soften, soften some edges just to make sure that the, light, the side that's catching the light is lighter. Uh, and you don't want too many hard edges with distant objects. For example, something like that. What are they doing? So... Can you yeah. tell me the dimensions of your frame? Some, someone's been asking about the dimensions of your frame, your mount. The mount, well, um, because, the, because the paper is 15 by 11 inches, um, I always work on the basis of, at the very least, two and a half inches mount at the sides and the top. And the bottom is always wider than the side and the top. So if the, if the side and the top are two and a half to three inches in width for this size of paper, perhaps, then the bottom would be, say, three and a quarter, three and a half. Why that is, is because when you're looking at a painting on a wall, if it's the same width all the way around, then you get a, a, what's the word? I can't think of the word. Uh, it nearly came to me then, but it, but it makes, the, the, the picture looks off center. It looks like it's lower down, an optical illusion. It looks like it's lower down if the boundary mount is the same width all the way around. So you make the bottom wider. And what that does do, it, your eye then sees the painting more, central and more supported in the frame. It's, it's a professional framers, pr proper framers will always do that. The lesser ones will, will do it the easy way and do a mount equal all the way around because it's quick and easy to do. And it's much harder to do it on a machine with fatter at the bottom, wider at the bottom.